Today is April 22nd, 2018. My name is Michael Joyner, and I am in San Diego Convention Center during the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society. Today I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing my friend and colleague, Dr. Victor Convertino, for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Convertino has been a member of the American Physiological Society since 1982. He's been a government scientist since 1987, working with NASA, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Army Medical Research Material Command. Dr. Convertino is a contributor to many areas of research, including regulation of plasma volume during exercise, um, interrelationships between plasma volume and electrolytes, and the adaptations to microgravity and thermal regulation during heat and exercise exposures, the effects of acute and chronic exercise on blood pressure regulation, and orthostatic uh, competence, development of exercise training countermeasures for astronauts and crew members of high-performance spacecraft, and the physiological adaptations to varying gravity environments. More recently, Dr. Convertino has been interested and whether some of his earlier insights from basic physiological research could be used to understand blood loss and compensation in individuals undergoing uh, hemorrhage and uh, body fluid loss as a result of traumatic injuries, specifically on the battlefield because of his interest uh, in military medicine. Vic, welcome to the Living History Project and thank you for agreeing uh, to be interviewed for this series. If you are ready, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your career. Oh, that's great, Mike, and I, I am honored myself to even be considered among all the great physiologists who have uh, contributed to the living uh, history. So thank you, and let's go to it. All right. Vic, you were born in Troy, in New York, in 1949, but you're really a Californian uh, by uh, early childhood, teenage years, college, and so forth. I wonder if you could give us a recap of how you got to California and what it was like when you got there and a little bit about your career in education uh, kind of from the early days. Well, uh, it always starts, uh, I think, for everybody with their parents. Uh, my um, father was in the service during uh, World War II uh, and one of his assignments um, uh, stateside was at the Presidio in, in uh, San Francisco and he fell in love with uh, California and I guess promised himself that uh, when the war was over and he started a family that he had eventually moved the family uh, to California from upper state New York, which is where our family really originated. Um, and so um, uh, he married my mother uh, in 1945 um, oh. and uh, he was, uh, my birthplace, Troy, New York, was because uh, he took advantage, as many veterans did, of the first GI Bill. Right. And uh, went to college at um, Rensselaer Polytechnic yep. Institute, one of the leading um, uh, engineering schools in the country. Uh, got his baccalaureate as a um, elect electrical engineer. And um, a few years later, in the mid-50s, he moved the family, kept his promise, and he moved himself in the family uh, to California, to San Jose. Right. Uh, and three years later, in 1958, he joined a new uh, National uh, Astronautics and Space Administration really? uh, at Ames Research Center, and he worked for NASA until he retired. So, so your family moved out there in the middle 50s when you would have been just starting grade school. Right, correct. Right. And so, Vic, how did you get interested in science? I mean, the obvious thing is your dad was clearly involved in it, but can you right. tell us about what really sparked your interest? Yeah, it's sort of interesting. I, I don't know that I did get interested in science. I think I had a char uh, inherent characteristic that I just loved games and I loved to solve mm -hmm. problems. And of course, I think that's a basis for right. uh, science. And so that really set the foundation for that. I, I, had, I really was not a very... Um, good student because I'd rather be out on a football field or a right. baseball field or a basketball court. Uh, my mother played a huge role in making sure she sat, sat down with me at least an hour every night to go over my studies and make mm -hmm. sure that mm -hmm. I was uh, learning. And uh, I think that really set the tone for me uh, beginning in school and, and getting interested. So, so you, we've talked about this many times because you and I have known each other for years and are good friends. Uh, Vic, you, you, you mentioned your interest in athletics and, and your interest in math and science, and you really, 
took advantage of the classic uh, California junior college system when you got out of high school. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I, uh, again, uh, not having confidence of being a very good academician, uh -huh. I thought it would be best to uh, try my wings first in community college. And the communi community college system in California is tops. I, right. um, it's pretty hard to uh, go above that. And they were integrated into the four-year uh, state right. system, so it made it very easy for me to get my lower division requirements right. out of the way with relatively good grades and go into uh, what was San Jose State uh, College at right. the time, came uni became university uh, later on. So, so, so you, 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 just looking at your CV here, you went to West Valley College in Campbell, California. You got your associate's degree in 1969. Then you went to San Jose State and got your bachelor's degree in physical education and mathematics. Right. So then what happened after that? <laughs> well, uh, the, the mathematics and physical education combination together is important because, um, again, my my real love was uh, on the athletic field. Right. I was good in mathematics. That's because I love to solve problems. And so academically, uh, that helped me get through school. But it was in my third year uh, of college at San Jose State right. that I uh, took my first so-called academic course in kinesiology. And it was the right. first time um, I saw the bringing together of the science, mathematics and physics right. with physical activity. And that uh, got me turned in the direction of um, looking at a career in uh, physiological sciences. You know, Vic, if you think about it, uh, physical education was just at the very beginning of its journey toward kinesiology, exercise science, exercise That's physiology. Great. Uh, in the in the early 1970s, and then you landed for a master's degree at the University of California, Davis. So here's a guy who starts off in junior colleges, goes to San Jose State, and then ends up at one of the premier research universities uh, in the country. Uh, what what can you tell us about that? Well, that uh, that is a sort of a story of who you know. Yeah. Um, the my major advisor at San Jose State, uh, Dr. Jim Bosco. Uh, collaborated with Dr. John Greenleaf at Ames Research Center, right. and, and Greenleaf was a major player in supporting my uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. He also collaborated with Dr. Ed Bernauer, who was at right. uh, the uh, physical education department at uh, UC Davis. And so um, uh, Dr. Bernauer actually had a contract with Dr. Greenleaf to support the early bed rest studies at NASA Ames, really? where bed rest was used, of course, uh, as you know, as a model for uh, weightlessness, the, uh, right. the impacts of uh, uh, weightlessness on the physiology. And so we studied that and became uh, one of the early reporters of how it decreased the capacity to do work, VO2 max, right. uh, and, and loss of blood volume and all of that. And that really... Um, uh, gave me direction in terms of the development of my career. And so, you know, if you look here, Vic, and we talked about it earlier, uh, you spent from uh, 1972 to 1981 in at, at Davis, got both a master's degree and a, a PhD from the University of California, Davis. And I think two things have struck me. One is, is if you could tell us a little bit about some of the personalities you met there, and also the, the the collaborative nature of the of the PhD program in physiological sciences there. I think it's very very important. It is important in, in the development of a graduate student. Um, uh, we happen to have something called the physiology group. It was not the physiology department, right. but it was a group that was made up of several departments, including physical education, animal uh, science, animal physiology, uh, human physiology, which was in the. Uh, School of Medicine, right? Uh, and so all of these, um, we had the opportunity of taking cl uh, classes in these different uh, departments with faculty members uh, from the uh, different departments, and it gave us a very broad perspective of what physiology really is. And in fact, uh, just the thought just reminded me of mm -hmm. um, the fact that we had one of the few comparative physiology right. uh, courses um, where we we learned about avian physiology and um, uh, fish physiology right. and how that uh, compared with human physiology to give us a broad perspective. You, you know, Vic, when, when students hear uh, senior people like yourself or, or take a look at, at a career like yours from the outside looking in, 
it looks like you know you just kind of made your way around this monopoly board and, and, and kind of just worked your way around Pasco, collect two hundred dollars and so <laughs> forth. But uh, not every, it wasn't all sweetness and light at, at Davis, and you had some setbacks, but you turned those setbacks into an advantage over time. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the major setback that I have uh, no problem uh, yeah. telling students particularly, uh, and it's a lesson in it uh, is not important that you got knocked down, but that you get sure. up again. And uh, I did not pass my oral exams the first time, oh. uh, which was not a happy uh, situation. And the chair of my committee, um, a very renowned uh, avian physiologist, uh, Dr. Ray Berger, right. uh, took me uh, under his wing and said, we're going to get this done. Uh, and every Monday and Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning for an hour, he met with me uh, for uh, six months. Really? And basically grilled me into the uh, really learning how to integrate and think uh, right. outside the box, and uh, I'm happy to say that the uh, next time through the um, uh, process of my oral exam, I uh, passed with flying colors. Well, and as you know, because when we met in the early 1980s, I was a, 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 a student at the University of Arizona, including a medical student, and you had a reputation there of being an outstanding didactic teacher. And I think at the time you told people it was because you had this tremendous background from Dr. Berger and others, and because you'd had this Socratic method that you were able to, to give these terrific presentations and were a good classroom teacher well, as a I result. Well, I appreciate that, but uh, and it took a lot of work, right. but it gets into the aspect that I've always loved teaching and I've loved right. the interaction with the students and telling stories, and really good physiology, as you know, Mike, is about <laughs> telling the story, incredible. right, and, and leading through the logic, and when there's a gap in the story, then that helps us direct where we need to go in research. So now you've graduated uh, from the University of California, Davis, You've, you've uh, started your work with NASA. You're interested in fluid volume, uh, body fluid regulation, blood volume regulation, exercise responses. You moved to Tucson. Tell us a little bit about that. So the move to Tucson was um, uh, an opportunity uh, was uh, with the announcement of an academic position. Right. They were looking for someone who could teach their graduate courses in exercise physiology and exercise biochemistry, and I, uh, those were my major and minor. Right. And I was able to convince them that I could do the job, and so I went there. Uh, that was about 50% uh, of my uh, mm -hmm. appointment. Uh, we also had a, um, I also co-taught with Dr. Jack Wilmore the right. um, graduate seminar class, right. which is where I met where you, you right, uh, absolutely. Uh, Mike. And um, then the other half was research. Um, and in the research part of it, most of my collaborative efforts were with students. Uh, I had, um, uh, I believe it was eight master's theses and uh, three PhDs uh, that I completed during my time there. Um, and then we um, also continued our collaboration with NASA Ames Research Center. So I was flying up to the Bay Area almost weekly uh, during the summer. Uh, where they were co still conducting bed rest studies, and I continued that uh, work there. So, if we, if, so now, we're, we're Vic, we're kind of at, at, at the end of the first phase of your career, and I can remember uh, doing a head-up immersion mm -hmm. study for you. I was a subject in somebody's study, and I sat in a tub of water up, up to my neck for about six hours while I diuresed yep. in an effort to uh, manipulate my blood volume. So I wonder if you could tell us, from the early 70s to the early or middle 80s, what, what do you think your major contribution was? I have my own ideas about it, but I want to hear about it from you. Uh, I, I think one of them uh, would have to be uh, the use of uh, really um, learning the physiological deconditioning that occurred with mm -hmm. uh, bed rest, and I think it had a significant impact because it was, we did that mostly through our studies in the 70s. Right. And by the end of the 70s and early 80s, the clinical community began to uh, adopt the practice of getting patients up after operations early on yeah, to get them moving. Sure. Yes, sure. exactly. And I think, I think that uh, probably was what I would consider one of our largest uh, and, and with just a couple of days of weightlessness or, 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 or bed rest, how much blood volume is lost, plasma volume is lost? It's on the order of 10 to 15 percent. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not insignificant, and that contributes, and it mostly happens in those first uh, few days. The real challenge is getting it back at the end of flight, and NASA, right. as you know, uh, spent uh, many years uh, trying to force that down astronauts, and the, um, 
John Blaha, one of the astronauts, yeah. said the only thing that we noticed that it did is it increased the uh, length of the line at the latrine before <laughs> reentry. We'll get back to that in a minute. But, yeah. but, but the other thing I think is, is that people who, who are me members of the society for a long time, especially people interested in exercise and environmental physiology, will remember the tremendous debates about some of the mechanisms of both plasma volume reduction and expansion with activity and inactivity, the arguments between uh, Leo Sine and, and Ethan Adele and others about whether you were washing proteins out of the interstitial space or synthesizing new proteins, the hormones responsible for it, as, as we got better assays for antidiuretic hormone right. and some of the other things. Yeah, so um, that was, <laughs> I, I'll stop by saying that was one of our um, real challenges as young scientists uh, in environmental and exercise <laughs> physiology is that we would walk into the uh, APS meetings uh, to give our presentations, and the first thing we would look for is to see if Dr. Sine was in the, in the audience. But uh, that was a big controversy um, uh, that he uh, described and uh, speculated, hypothesized, right. that uh, plasma volume increased because he did the studies in those uh, diamond mine uh, yeah, workers. Uh, workers in South Africa, and uh, there was a a drastic increase in plasma and these volume. were people who were heat adapted. Yes, but um, he felt that uh, this was due to the protein shift in because protein uh, concentration didn't change. Change, right. So that was, and, and he, his argument was all of this happened too quickly for uh, this right. to be de novo, um, protein increase and increase in plasma volume. And so actually one of the studies that uh, uh, we conducted at Arizona, right. uh, we were actually able to show uh, the balances, the ins and the outs, right. and in fact uh, the show that uh, the increase in plasma and blood volume with exercise is due to de novo increase in, in right. protein and increase in the actual amount of body fluids, and that's the first time that that had been shown. Not to have too big of a digression, but you mentioned how uh, the meetings were spirited back in those yes, days, they were. and I am also thinking about the uh, interactions that Professors Carl Wasserman and George Brooks had about the control of ventilation, skeletal muscle hypoxia, and lactate formation. Do you think we're better off now with a, a uh, more subdued environment uh, in the Q&A at these sorts of meetings, or do you think it was uh, better back in the good old days when people got a little <laughs> hot under the collar? Uh, or both? I think, I think there's a mixture of both. Um, I think what we see today is more of what we call the millennial generation um, uh, issue of everybody's good, and, and so there's no reason to, to have the hot debates. I think the hot debates were very helpful to, to me, right. and I think others uh, in our line of work um, uh, the contributions that uh, Dr. Sine and others made right. uh, by challenging, challenging us made us think more, and I think that's uh, and, where and we I were able to advance new ideas. APS has kept that going through the point, counterpoint and other related mechanisms yes. in the journals, yes, which I correct. think has been very, very helpful, and then the chance for people to make commentaries on those as well. Correct. So, now Vic, in, in 1985, you moved to the Kennedy Space Center first as a contractor, I believe with... Uh, Bionetics, and then you became a full-blown NASA uh, uh, investigator. Tell us about what happened and, and why you moved and what happened at the Kennedy Space Center. Well, I think, I think the move was um, really driven by the fact that I had an opportunity to go back to NASA, and, mm -hmm. and that work uh, I found to be uh, some of the highlights of my career. Uh, it's exciting. It's exciting being around and working with astronauts, yep. and, and some of the engineers who are ingenious with the, right. the way they've... Uh, uh, been able to um, uh, progress in how we can get individuals and support individuals in space. Um, uh, so th that was uh, that was a big goal, and and that really drove that. Um, when uh, what they were really looking for, another reason I went is they were looking for um, an exercise physiologist. Right who could help work the, pro the problem of, could we use exercise as a countermeasure against orthostatic hypotension following space flight and the issues that astronauts were having with feigning? And so the rationale was bed rest and, and, and microgravity causes a loss of plasma volume, blood volume. Acute exercise and chronic exercise can expand it, so could you kind of get the yin and the yang there and, and offset one with the other? Yes, that was the idea, but there was what led to more experiments as we realized that there's certainly more to blood pressure regulation than sure. just the circulating volume. So I got into the area of, uh, as you well know, right. beginning to isolate 
barrel reflex functions and see how they were also affected. And we found that they were, um, their sensitivities were decreased with uh, microgravity. So we began to look at does acute uh, right. um, exercise increase that? And I think the biggest, um, we focused a lot on the research there with what the impact of acute intense exercise was. And, and I think the biggest, uh, it led to our biggest accomplishment, and that was we showed in a 16-day bed rest study, more than two weeks, uh, the deterioration and orthostatic hypotension was completely reversed or restored with uh, one bout of maximal single exercise bout of maximum 24 right. hours before the individuals Classic got Classic studies. Yeah. I, I think the other thing, Vic, too, and you might want to mention this, is, is, is that I think... Um, you know, you have these, and some of your review articles from that era, or maybe a few years later, the early 90s, certainly, middle 90s, you've got these terrific figures of the time courses of, of the loss of, of, of plasma volume, red cell mass, blood volume, so forth, and then how it comes back with reconditioning. And yep. so, so I think that, that you talk about integrative physiology, you talk about, you know, your interest in comparative physiology and other things, but I think these time course diagrams which put it all together. And, and, and you weren't able to get those in a single study, were, were you? That was insights from how many studies do you think? Oh, I, uh, that's a good point. It, it probably uh, 10, 20 studies because you have to piece it together and you don't always right. make, as you know, all the measurements. You think about exactly. those after the fact. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we had to put together uh, the scenarios. And, 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 and Vic, the other thing I think people need to think about too is, is even those of us who study humans and do acute or studies or interventions, you put people to bed rest for how long? So the longest that uh, we, uh, the longest study that I've participated in is 30 days. Right. Uh, and that means that they don't get up at all. Right. So I'm always asked, well, how did they go to the, uh, right. you know, urinate and defecate? Uh, we used bedpans. Uh, we had a special uh, shower for them to shower in the uh, horizontal position. So it was uh, just like being in space flight from the standpoint right. of no... Uh, head-to-toe gravitational uh, force um, uh, any time but, but these period. are heroic studies multiple measurements made in these individuals over over really a month yeah so it really points to one of the strongest parts of um, the advantage I had in working with NASA is the team approach to research so everybody brought their right. capabilities uh, we had great support staff and it took a, a team of maybe 20 or more uh, individuals to actually run one of these studies it, it was heroic right. right right so so let's just recap for a second so you the first part of your career you really established uh, some of the time courses magnitude and kinetics of of these um, of these uh, shifts in plasma and blood volume. Mm -hmm. Then in this kind of second phase when you were at NASA, you showed that this was clearly a problem, but it was more than just blood volume changes in terms of orthostatic intolerance. It was baroreceptor dysfunction. And the key observation uh, besides these mechanisms was that, that there was a, a simple countermeasure, which was maximum exercise. Yes. And so um, it provided me with the new perspective that all exercise training is is it's acute bouts, <laughs> it's repeated acute, acute bouts of exercise with the recovery period maybe being as important, if not more yeah. important, uh, than any other factor of exercise per right. se because it, it allows the body to respond to the intense exercise stimulus. Well, you know, and I think it's interesting too because we hear a lot today about high intensity exercise and mm -hmm. certainly in your, in your studies in the 80s and early 90s, that's what you were using. Yes. So you're probably 20, 30 years ahead of that. <laughs> well, I don't know about there. that. But I can tell you that um, the, uh, the uh, cosmonauts, the uh, Soviet yeah. space program, had been using a, a, uh, an approach of having their cosmonauts exercise, really crank up the intensity just a couple days before they re-entered. So anecdotally, they, they, they understood that something was happening in this, and we just right. were able to provide the data behind it. So, so now what, you moved to San Antonio. So tell us about the move to San Antonio. Well, um, the move to San Antonio, uh, there, is, there is a story behind that tell because us. at the end of uh, my stay at Kennedy Space Center, about first of all, there this? was, so this is um, uh, 1993. Okay. Um, the wisdom of NASA was that they were going to um, consolidate 
all human research where the astronauts lived, and that's Johnson Space Center right. in Houston. Um, I didn't feel that that move, if I wanted to stay with NASA, I would have had to stay, go to Houston. Right. I didn't think that that was the best uh, move for a number of reasons for my career. And fortunately, I um, had a colleague, um, uh, Carter Alexander, who used to be with NASA, exercise physiologist, and, and now he was the uh, plans and program manager for Brooks Air Force Base. And he said, well, if you have to move your family to Texas, Oh, we consider coming to San Antonio, right. and we like that uh, move, and I like the opportunity there. Uh, so we came uh, to work at Brooks Air Force Base uh, for the Air Force. But before going there, right at the end of my stay at Kennedy Space mm -hmm. Center, the prototype shop at, um, uh, that works on the shuttle uh, built us an LBNP uh, device. An LBNP's and lower body lower negative, body negative, negative pressure. pressure and and Mike, I know you've seen it. Oh, it's uh, this is this is a, a, a one uh, in the world type of uh, device, truly um, space age. Uh, and the issue was, I want I needed to take it with right. me, and so I had to figure out a way, which I did, to get the new commander at Brooks Air Force Base to write a memorandum of understanding with the director at Kennedy Space Center, because we were within the government, we could make this move. Huh. And uh, we got the uh, lower body negative pressure out of NASA and got it to the air. And, and all I can say is the engineers, I've seen the device, Vic, the engineers with the pocket protectors from NASA <laughs> yeah. had really gone hog and, and the machinists and so forth. Yeah. So was your intention when you moved to the Air Force in San Antonio to continue to work on the, on the problems of gravitational stress because the, the pilots have high G-forces and so forth? Right, this was a great opportunity. So as you know, now I've had the opportunity to work on the cardiovascular system and blood pressure regulation is really the overriding right. uh, issue here. In And it's adaptation to low gravity environments. Right. And now I had the unique opportunity to see how it adapts to high gravity right. um, uh, stimuli. And so that's what we did, and we wanted to have that lower body negative pressure chamber so that we could actually test and, and um, examine the, physiolo the physiology underlying right. adaptation to high G. And I wonder if you could tell people, uh, tell the audience that, that LBNP, you know, they're sitting there thinking, well, wow, you're in the Air Force, you could have just used some one of their big centrifuges or you could do a tilt table, but tell us about the advantages of a lower body negative pressure. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, by placing the individual in this chamber, their lower body is um, uh, in the chamber, they are at rest, they're not moving, supine. and it allows it, supine, and so it allows us to control uh, the entire environment and then uh, stimulate different barrel reflector systems um, by uh, decreasing the pressure in the chamber and redistributing blood away from uh, the head and the heart, and it's very much like your high G, but we're able to control it uh, more. Right, right, um, right. So, so how long? How how long? And I'm a little unclear with this. How long did the was was it Air Force and then the shift to the Army? So I was with the Air Force uh, for uh, about five and a half years, and then the base realignment and closure. Uh, panel, BRAC, yeah, BRAC right? um, uh, came through, started in 1995, and by 1998, uh, their decision was to move um, the School of Aerospace Medicine and all crew physiology mm -hmm. uh, to Wright-Patterson, um, uh, which is where um, uh, now all of the Air Force in Ohio, human fi in Ohio uh, at Dayton. And so that left me looking for a job again. And so, uh, and I didn't want to move the family out of, uh, out of San Antonio. So I uh, basically went up the road and uh, looked and they had a position in uh, combat casualty care to offer right. me at, at uh, the Institute of Surgical Research. And that's how it got there. And oh, by the way, we had to move the LBMP again uh, yeah, exactly. from the Air Force to the Army. So now we've kind of come full circle. You start off with, with hypovolemia associated with physical inactivity, space flight, bed rest, and so forth. You start off with then exercise training as a countermeasure. Then you get into these high G forces. And when you get to the Army, you, you realize that, that maybe you've got a different kind of hypovolemia. And some of the same issues you've been thinking about 
I guess, what, what year is it now? 20, uh, early 2000s? Uh, 1998 is when 1998. We, we went over there. So, so uh, you've been thinking about this for around 25 years since the middle, earlier middle 70s. And so now you're going to repurpose some of these concepts and some of this uh, intellectual, uh, uh, some of these intellectual paradigms again. Tell us about that. Well, so this is, uh, this is really a, a great influence that uh, Dr. Mike Saga Saka right. has had on me, and, and that is this concept of hypovolemia. And it doesn't really matter where it comes from, right? Uh, right? It, it's the underlying physiology of all of these uh, uh, problems. And so uh, hemorrhage, as you know, the leading cause of death on right. the battlefield, more importantly, the leading cause of preventable death. Right. If we know that it's coming and, and uh, what to do with it and to intervene early. Uh, and so it turned out that the uh, lower body negative pressure also was an excellent model of hypovolemia and therefore for hemorrhage. And it allowed us then to study, uh, as you know, because we've done a lot of this work in collaboration Sorry, you with bet. your laboratory, uh, Mike, to redefine um, uh, hemorrhage, the, physio the human physiology of hemorrhage, and most importantly by doing that, to identify that there is a subpopulation of about one out of every three individuals who don't compensate very well. And so it allowed us to get into the work of and, beginning to And by to compensate, you, you mean that, that, that they become hypovolemic and they're not able to maintain their blood pressure. That's correct. And I think what a lot of people don't understand, if, if they haven't seen this in, in real life in a human, either a patient or, or LBNP or even tilting, is it's the old Ernest Hemingway quote, how did you go bankrupt two ways, gradually, then suddenly? So people maintain their blood pressure, at Vic, and then all of a sudden they have a, a rapid collapse. Now some people can, that happens very, very late. Other people, it doesn't take much. Right, and so um, uh, the clinical community ex uh, describes all the time that they are fooled by the fact that our, our current medical monitors uh, make the measurements that stay consistent throughout right. because they're being compensated for, and then all of a sudden the patient, uh, they don't know it's coming, and now you've got Boom. a patient in shock, and you're working behind the power curve. So, so, so you now, now you've, you, you, you've gotten into this idea where, 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 again, you've made these basic observations, you came up with a countermeasure for NASA, now you're working on issues related to monitoring and decision support uh, in what's called combat casualty care. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, so um, again, we noted we we recognized early on that there uh, had to be a um, a focus on trying to measure compensation and not the outcome of compensation, and so uh, we began um, to look at different variables uh, and particularly as it related to these good compensators and poor compensators, and we found that. Um, uh, very simply, the uh, features of the arterial waveform, or PPG, gives us all that information. That is a total integrated signal right. for all of the compensatory mechanisms, both on the heart and on the vascular space. And so we've teamed up with um, some robotics engineers, real smart engineers who know now this um, field of machine learning and feature extraction, and this has led to right. um, the measurement of uh, compensatory uh, response, and we've termed this the compensatory reserve. Right. So that, that's really, it's almost like you've come kind of full circle, yeah. cir cir uh, circle with this interest in math many, many years ago and physiology and kind of brought them all together. Yeah. Now, you know, I wanted you to uh, talk for a minute about some of the people that have been influential in your career, but especially our, our colleague, Dr. Greenleaf. Yeah. So uh, let's start with um, Dr. Jim Bosco. I, right. I mentioned him early at San Jose State. Um, I can remember the first day walking out of that kinesiology class um, with the feeling uh, and thought that this is the guy I want to be right. when I, yep. he was one of these individuals, as you indicated, the technology had not advanced very, we were learning heart rate and yeah, blood right. pressure and all, um, but he had a passion for uh, the work that he was doing, and that just spread. You just right. felt that passion, you wanted to go forward. Uh, because he collaborated with Dr. Greenleaf, um, uh, John Greenleaf really was um, uh, my um, most supporting 
I will say that, um, mm -hmm. mentor, because uh, he actually gave up not only his time and his efforts, but his laboratory to me. I, I was able to do my dissertation mm -hmm. research uh, in his uh, lab, as well as learn things like the Showlander gas analyzer, <laughs> uh, where we calibrated all the gases. Sure. Uh, we didn't have these automated um, uh, automated instruments to do VO2. We actually collected the gas from a, a Parkinson Cowan meter uh, and clip, clamped it and brought it over to an analyzer and put, that was calibrated on the Showlander. Okay. Uh, and that's the type of experience uh, that um, you can't get anywhere else. And I think the, the two primary um, uh, points or lessons that I learned from John Greenleaf um, was one um, that you got to pub publish. Um, he, right. he was so prolific at writing, and I was not a very good writer at first, but uh, that was one of the lessons that the only way you're going to become a good writer is to write and to publish. If you don't publish, your work was never done. Right. Um, he did that. And then the other interesting thing is um, uh, it really directed my career to human research. Uh, sure. because he was the director of the Human Environmental uh, Physiology Laboratory at Ames. Um, and he had the philosophy that you never ask a human subject to do anything that you're not willing to do first. And so every one of my experiments, I was the first subject. And equal uh, one, yeah. yeah so sure. That's right. So, you know, Vicki, you, when you see the highlights of, of your career that we've, we've kind of gone over in terms of some of the scientific observations, do you see them as a continuum? Do you see one thing kind of leading to the next and, and you, what you just sort of stumbled onto? How, how do you see the whole narrative? Oh, wow. In, that, in retrospect. Yeah. I think it is a continuum, Mike, because I think where it, start, where it starts is where it continues and will end. Um, and you and I have talked about this a lot. I don't know that I could have gotten better physiological training um, in integrative systemic physiology yeah. than in physical education in, yeah, in a right. field that deals with the whole body and how right. it uh, performs. And when you do that, then you learn uh, that um, the heart and the vascular space uh, do not work alone, uh, but they are influenced by respiration. Sure, They're yeah. influ influenced by the kidney um, uh, and by the muscle pump, the skeletal muscle pump. And so the system works together in um, that's, it has been a continuum. You know, you mentioned Dr. Greenleaf's interest, uh, Vic, in, in publications, and you've got uh, around 300 publications, I think a few more. So that's really quite prolific over many, many years, uh, a number of very high impact, uh, uh, highly cited papers, and these terrific review articles that I mentioned earlier. And, and how do you, you know, most of the people in the society, or many people in the society work in medical schools or main campuses, physiology departments, uh, you've worked in, in government labs primarily since the middle 1980s for the last, I guess, 30 plus years. I wonder if you could give us some perspective about that. I, I think there might be a perspective or actual bias that uh, one can't have an academic career or right. a high research uh, career or productive scientific career in uh, government laboratories. I have found just the opposite. Um, uh, I do, I, I'm able to do pretty much everything that an mm -hmm. academician, um, I have adjunct faculty positions and I go out and lecture routinely. Um, uh, I have, uh, over the years, uh, been on the committees of, um, 12 master's degrees and 15 PhD degrees, right. many of which I was an advisor on. So I've had students, we have students routinely come through as interns, right. uh, and all. And then, um, uh, and then we have the capability and the opportunity to write. Um, and we don't have to spend as much time writing on grants mm -hmm. to, uh, com to compete at NIH because we have internal mm -hmm. uh, funding and we have outstanding um, laboratory uh, facilities, right. Mike. So uh, um, it's, it's been a great career, but it's because it's supported well in academic type of, of activities uh, right. within the government. Vic, so as you reflect and you think about our field going forward, you think about uh, the next phase of your career, I guess what would you tell young people going into physiology today? Oh, um, <laughs> that's uh, where do I start? I think the very first thing I would tell them is don't, um, don't sell yourself short. Um, ah. To um, go for it, to get... Um, 
to have different experiences uh, so that they can pick something that they're really passionate about right. and, and they're going to um, uh, go forward with. Um, I'd also tell them, don't be afraid not to succeed. A failure is a great, yeah. um, is a great uh, teacher. Um, I, I almost would guess that virtually every one of my successes have been preceded by um, a failure. Um, use your time wisely. Uh, time is the one thing we don't have control of. It goes, uh, I think what I tell students usually is they won't believe how quickly they get to my point. Uh, in well, life. I think so, when we met, we both had a full head of hair. Yeah, yeah, that uh, and, and, that, and, and, that goes along. A full head of dark hair. Yeah, that goes along uh, uh, with that. So, um, I think those are probably the the best key uh, messages right. that uh, I would have for students. Well, I want to thank you a lot, Dr. Convertino, and I want yes, to thank you for this wonderful you. conversation. I want to thank the society for inviting me to host uh, Dr. Convertino, and I especially want to thank Vic for his many contributions uh, to physiology. Thank you.